Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Oleg, and I'm representing here Wave. Uh, it's a company in London, and uh, we're working on self-driving. And uh, this specific uh, talk would be about language and video generation models in autonomous driving. So not specifically about, you know, self-driving per se, but a bit um, uh, several technologies that we are developing and researching that kind of goes along the along the right kind of um, all right. So yeah, so self-driving uh, is at this point is already quite a, a you know a established field. So if you guys don't know, it started in uh, 1988. That was the first car, and you guys should check it out, uh, students. How cool it was! It was just driving on the left here from just one uh, line, effectively from the camera. And then uh, coming uh, forward, uh, we had several uh, DARPA challenges that kind of gave rise to the whole self-driving industry. And uh, from that time, uh, the self-driving stack uh, was mainly built uh, kind of based on this uh, scheme where uh, we had several components, uh, well, uh, quite a lot of them actually. And uh, typically you would uh, take inputs from uh, many sensors, uh, LIDARs, cameras, etc. Uh, then you would go for perception, uh, where you would want to detect many uh, different objects, uh, lanes, and obviously pedestrians and cars and so on. Have some mapping localization system. And then you will have planning modules where you do route planning, motion planning, behavior planning, and so on prediction. You would use your maps, and then at some point you will generate um, uh, motion control sig uh, signals. Uh, but then... Uh, you know, uh, last, I would say, 10 years, uh, you guys all know about uh, the shift from uh, component-based architectures to just deep learning systems. And uh, here's uh, one of the examples I found. Uh, so, for example, if you want to do language translation in 2010, that's the system you would use, where it would split uh, things on sentences and phrases, et cetera, et cetera. And now you just pretty much use one single huge model to do any translation you want so you can see it just translates in any languages including choosing the languages it translates to okay so obviously played with the um, gpt systems um and uh, uh kind of together with that uh, there was this notion that emerged um uh by uh andre carpati uh, of software 2.0 where uh, he kind of noticed this paradigm shift where before we uh, were having data uh, and coming up with our own code and uh, which is program and putting in the computer and getting outputs. And uh, that was a kind of idea of software 2.0, uh, 1.0 and software 2.0 is where uh, we using data and the correct outputs, uh, put it in uh, some kind of machine learning system and get the program out of that without coding it ourselves. And uh, there are many uh, benefits to that approach, which are not quite obvious, which are more like uh, engineering. So first of all, it's computationally homogeneous since it uses neural networks. So it means it's highly portable and um, uh, it's hardware friendly. Well, you have a nice hardware. Uh, you get constant runtime and memory use. So there are no surprises. Uh, it's quite a agile development because you don't have to have many teams that kind of work on different modules. You have this one big system uh, that you have to set up. And uh, the main thing, it actually offers superior performance to human coders, right? So uh, all that uh, uh, kind of made several industries to uh, a transition to software 2.0, including computer vision that would used to be, you know, detecting lines and corners and moving to deep networks, et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of know all other fields like speech synthesis, chatbots, obviously, recommendation system, game solving, protein folding, and so on. Uh, so based on that idea, Wave is uh, is, is a self-driving company that also, uh, it's kind of example of transitioning from component-based approach to this AV 2.0 approach, which is the software 2.0 based on deep learning, but applied to self-driving. Uh, the way our system works is that we take camera, uh, camera inputs uh, and then uh, and, and a kind of GPS and uh, pretty much that's it and put it into one big network that covers all the components I presented uh, before in a uh, common cell driving stack and uh, uh, that's it it just outputs uh, control signals that we can use to drive the car and uh, 
this is the uh, yeah hopefully you see the video well yeah uh so th this is uh, just a demo video of our model that is uh, again trained end to end cameras only and it drives uh in central london quite complicated uh scenarios uh, you probably you know see some snippets uh you know but uh yeah just a nice kind of video where it goes along and um uh, navigates all sorts of complicated situations. Uh, oops. Uh, hold on. Okay, yeah, it's playing. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, one specific thing that you get out of it is exactly this uh, kind of better than a human coder uh, behaviors. So those are emergent behaviors specifically at the bottom two. Uh, you can see that uh, it ignores a white paper, uh, just a newspaper on the road, but it doesn't ignore uh, uh, just uh, trash bins uh, that, were, that were tipped over. And uh, we didn't uh, train, uh, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't train the system to do that explicitly. So we don't have any uh, newspaper detectors or uh, trash bin detectors or any of that. We just train it from human demonstrations and uh, this is what it uh, kind of decided to do which is exactly the promise of this approach where you just put a lot of data into a big neural network and you get the good results. Uh, but there are limitations to that approach. So first of all, it's computationally expensive. So we need a lot of compute. We need very power powerful GPUs on board uh, and expensive clusters of machines to train all of that. Uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, that approach obviously requires a lot of data. So data is the king, so we have to have a special team to just uh, deal with data. Uh, we have to acquire and store this multicam video data somewhere, which is a big engineering challenge. It's uh, uh, hard to label if we use uh, labeling approaches. We need data infrastructure and you know deal a lot with data. Uh, uh, but uh, next uh, few limitations are kind of more interesting, and this is uh, the ones that I'm going to be talking about. So first of all, um, AV 1.0 approaches have uh, quite strong methods in a, in a kind of area of planning. So there are several planning methods, uh, RRTs, trajectory optimization, and so on and so on, uh, obviously A stars and um, variants that solve this uh, long horizon uh, problems of prediction and uh, where exactly you want it to go and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, if we just use a big uh, network, uh, we found, which is kind of obvious, it's kind of scales not so well uh, with the length of um, uh, input and output uh, in, in time. Uh, specifically, in our system, we take uh, several uh, uh, timestamps of uh, several uh, several cameras, right? So you have to combine all of that, um, put it into big uh, neural network, which at this point is a large transformer model, uh, and then you want to predict the trajectory out of that. So scaling in, in time is not uh, kind of well supported at this point. So it's not like intrinsic limitation, but something that we, uh, well, and the whole kind of uh, community haven't figured out yet well. Uh, and the second limitation is that uh, with that approach, we kind of don't quite know what happens inside this large black box that we train. Uh, so explainability, debugging is, is not really straightforward. For many, uh, and you want those features for many reasons. You want to fix the errors. You want to prove that your system can do something that you that is supposed to do. So testing and evaluation becomes complicated, and so on. So you want to solve that as well. Um, uh, so our solutions to uh, to those uh, problems, to those uh, uh, final two limitations, uh, were development of uh, two generative uh, uh, models. Uh, kind of uh, the generative AI models, uh, and uh, one is called Gaia, which is a video generation model, uh, which takes uh, video input, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, some conditioning, and produces uh, video output. And the second uh, model is Lingo, which is video question answering model. It also takes uh, video and uh, produces uh, well, it kind of and in. It goes on and uh, provides you uh, answers to your questions. So, so you can uh, query it with uh, different questions and answers. So I'll, I'll demo that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I'll just show how they 
this is kind of how our work in progress. How, how do we approach solving this explainability prediction playing? So the first one is Gaia video generation model. So video generation and cell driving just recently started to emerge as a new field. You can see a few samples here. Uh, check out those people. Uh, like how they kind of walk here on those roads and how cars are merging. So this is an emergent uh, field here. You can see that here cars are merging inside each other and so on. Uh, but uh, it's kind of coming together and uh, we are one of the state of the art models in that, uh, in that area. So this is the high level architecture. So a bit of technical uh, details here. So first of all, um, uh, yeah, that was done uh, by our, our modeling team led by Gianluca and you guys can uh, have, a, uh, have a look at the uh, technical um, report uh, we released with all the details, but here I'm just going to tell you about the architecture a little bit. So uh, we take uh, input video, some text and actions for conditioning, uh, tokenizes, uh, tokenize that with an uh, image encoder, and this is a disc, uh, discrete uh, VQVAE that uh, produces discrete image tokens, which is kind of one of the things that uh, was beneficial to train uh, the model. Then uh, we train the actual world model, which is, uh, uh, and the, uh, <clears throat> what this does is uh, takes those input tokens from the video and auto-regressively produces tokens uh, for next frame. You then take those tokens, put them back, and keep going. So the same way as uh, ChatGPT works, the same way as all language models work, you kind of auto-regressively generate a token, uh, put it back, and kind of keep going. Except in that case, it's not a text token per se, but uh, it's an image token. So then after you're done generating a bunch of tokens, you kind of make a frame out of that. Um, uh, Right. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the last uh, part of it is the video encoder, where you take all the uh, tokens that you generated and you try to uh, make a very nice video out of that. Uh, so a few important uh, uh, bits uh, uh, about this architecture is, first of all, encoder and decoder are not uh, shared. Uh, so, so they're not, they're not the same. So we uh, we use image encoder just to tokenize the frames, but we use video decoder for many other things that I'm going to describe later. And uh, one big thing here in terms of data that the whole model is pretty much over, you know, overwhelming majority of it is self-supervised. So we don't have to label a data for it. We just need to predict next frame, which is kind of a big deal because you don't have to engage with labeling, uh, and so on and so on. Um, right. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last part of, of this model, which is video uh, decoder, is quite interesting. Uh, specific, uh, the task of it is to take those tokens uh, and use the diffusion process to generate uh, actual realistic images. And uh, we actually ended up with a system that is uh, that has several fun uh, functionalities. Uh, after training, it can not only recover uh, just decoded frames out of token and generate videos, but also it can do video upsampling, uh, in, interpolation, and auto regressive video generation. So this is how we, uh, we uh, our world model works on a 6.25 hertz, but with that uh, powerful decoder, we are able to uh, generate videos which are 25 um, hertz uh, uh, frame rate that I'm going to show later. Uh, and obviously, one of the big recipes for success was scaling it up. And uh, in the last year, we scaled up uh, dramatically. We observed scaling curves that uh, clearly show, OK, well, the more uh, data and compute you put into the system, the better the behavior. And uh, here are some videos that we are able to generate. So those are all imagined videos. You can see that they look very, very real. And uh, from the first glance, it's very hard to save that they are generated. You can sometimes see artifacts. Uh, I don't know in which 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 the point. I probably don't see my pointer. Maybe you do. Anyway, uh, yeah, so you can see that cars have sometimes a little bit like weirder shapes, but you don't see any like drastic uh, uh, unrealistic effects where you know cars or pedestrians like merge into each other and and, and so on 
And uh, one big thing that uh, uh, our world modeling team achieved is uh, this very long stable generation. So we are able to generate very long, several minutes uh, length videos that just don't uh, deteriorate. They, so the car just keeps imagining how it goes on in London, including night and, and day and uh, uh, during different weather conditions. Uh, another thing it can do is uh, because our uh, generation is stochastic, we can uh, generate diverse features from uh, a single uh, kind of seed, uh, seed video. So you can see here that uh, the seeded video was just a uh, starting of that frame where, <coughs> where, where we were approaching a roundabout. Uh, but then later uh, in one rollout system decided to go left, another one to go right. And uh, you can see that the generations are still quite real and so on. Uh, since it's language condition, we actually can control exactly, not exactly, but I mean, at this point, roughly what it can generate. So uh, importantly, for example, if we generate, if we say rainy, it actually generate camera artifacts for us as well, right? So it's, uh, so those are, you know, raindrops that the model generates itself. Uh, then we can come up with, uh, you know, add snow to the, the regions that we actually have not observed with snow, uh, fog, and so on. Uh, next, uh, so the second uh, system that we have is uh, Lingon, which is language generation model. Uh, since I'm kind of doing good on time, I feel like I'm going to show a few more videos at the end. Uh, all right. Uh, so as for Lingo, uh, it, when uh, ChatGPT uh, emerged, uh, you know, last year, beginning of the year, uh, one of the things that we immediately tried to do is uh, to see how well it go it does on uh, self-driving questions. And we discovered uh, to our pleasant surprise that uh, it actually does quite well. So here you can, uh, I'll just read that. Uh, if you're driving along and a ball rolls out on the road in front of you, what might happen next? And uh, this is obviously zero shot because we didn't train ChatGPT. Uh, and uh, it responds that the ball, uh, uh, you know, if, 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 if you see the ball, you, you might have to break or swerve to avoid hitting it uh, and so on and so on, right? So very reasonable things. And you kind of can keep going. You can say, what if uh, you're driving next to a school? And the model will correctly tell you that, okay, well, in this case, you have to be even extra cautious because most likely the ball is coming from kids playing near the, near the school, et cetera, et cetera. And... Uh, if you then ask uh, what if the current time is a midnight, then correctly kind of uh, says, well, in that case, it is unlikely that there would be kids, et cetera, et cetera, but you still have to be careful. So uh, you can see that we just have a, a lot of knowledge already inside those large language models, and it would be so nice to just use it uh, instead of us developing you know, data sets and so on for reasoning and self-driving. Why not we just can why not just us using those large language model for self driving? Uh, uh, so the next uh, idea here again relate to explainability. So if you do have this model, driving model that can actually answer your questions and respond to you about everything it does, including what it sees, what it's about to do, what's the attention it pays to, does it know road rules? Uh, and uh, predicting all counterfactuals, if you probe with those questions, you might uh, find uh, all sorts of error cases, places where it doesn't quite work well. Uh, also, it would explain its decisions if you find some kind of bug and, and so on and so on. So this is like a big uh, window inside the model, the ability to query with a natural language question. Uh, and the uh, last one about planning and reasoning. Uh, so with world models, since it can predict into the future and with language, uh, we would be able to have way more uh, long-term uh, planning systems where first of all, we can plan and reason in natural language, uh, which, uh, uh, which would require us to, which would allow us to reason about very complicated things like, you know, what do you do if you see a school sign and a ball, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can predict futures and so on. So that's kind of the promise of those two models. 
so this is the architecture of the lingua model. Um, the way it works again, it takes in a video snippet. Then we then uh, we go through a, a image encoder. In that case, we just use standard clip. Um, uh, then we have our uh, well several options for video encoding where we want to uh, merge information about uh, all the embedded frames into some kind of cohesive representation about the video snippet. We put that in into uh, off the shelf uh, language model because we want to get you know all the reasoning off the shelf instead of us training it. Uh, we fine tune all of that and uh, how to regressively predict uh, in that case uh, text tokens and uh, that makes us uh, that gives the ability to perform a dialogue with the model. So ask a question and get a response. Uh, we train that uh, model on a lot of different data sets including uh, some academic data sets, but uh, we invested a lot in auto-labeling as well. Uh, specifically, we uh, we can use a lot of labeled data sets that, you know, where we can have cuboids and segmentations and then extract uh, textual inf information from that, uh, describe it in text, uh, then use uh, ChatGPT to ask questions, uh, get answers and produce a lot of uh, data samples that we that are completely automatically generated without any human uh, interactions. But at the same time, we also established uh, all sorts of uh, human in the loop uh, schemes, including reinforcement learning from human feedback, where uh, we get uh, responses from humans uh, and uh, kind of fine tune the model so that it uh, generates better responses to, uh, to actual questions that humans uh, answer. Um, yeah, so we got a lot of data set to train it. And uh, here are some uh, results. Uh, let me play everything. Uh, the first uh, capability is just kind of description of what's going on and what is it about to do. Uh, you can see here uh, that it just says in the top left, I'm turning right, continue to my, you know, I'm overtaking the bus now. That is coming to a stop. Uh, I'm still uh, staying stop. I'm turning right, and so I'm accelerating uh, to the speed of the traffic, et cetera, et cetera. So it can describe what's going on. Uh, uh, and uh, most importantly, we can start query it. So I'm going, just going to read what's happening. So why are you stopped? I'm stopped because the traffic light is red. Uh, what are the top three hazards you are paying attention to? The top three hazards I'm paying attention to are traffic light, the cyclists in front of me and the pedestrians crossing the road. Why? I'm paying attention to this hazard because they can impact my safety and the safety of others on the road. Where can you, uh, when can you go? I can go when the traffic light turns green. And you can see that it was all matching the, the scene. Uh, another example, uh, what's the weather like? It's rainy. Do you drive differently? Uh, yes, I need to be more cautious due to the uh, rainy conditions. Uh, how come? Due to the rainy conditions, the road might be slippery and visibility might be reduced. So I need to drive more cautious, uh, cautiously. Uh, when will you go? I will go once the black sedan in front of me starts moving. When will it stop raining? I cannot predict when it will stop raining. Is it true that it always rains in London? Uh, no, it's not true that all it rains London. However, it's known for its rainy weather. So, uh, yeah, you can see here that while it knows about self-driving, it also knows uh, all sorts of just facts about the world because uh, we kind of took it up uh, from the shelf and kind of didn't break it, right? Okay, so some conclusions. And then uh, if you guys want to have a few more videos. Uh, uh, so end-to-end -end technologist, and specifically, uh, uh, end technologies are future if they if we applied for autonomous driving. So uh, we are uh, pioneers in that field, uh, and we call our approach AV 2.0. Uh, generative AI methods can close the remaining gaps in AV 2.0. So specifically, video generation, language generation models can uh, help us with prediction, explainability, and planning. 
Uh, yeah, and you can see one important kind of thing is that uh, all models are currently all use the same architecture, which is a big transformer model that predict tokens. So it seems like all systems converge to just scaled up sequence predictors. And uh, I don't know if I, since I have, I have like about four, four more videos just for fun. Uh, so this is diverse features from Gaia. Um, you can see that in one case, the car, uh, the white car goes uh, back into the driveway. Uh, another way, uh, in another video, it decides to go on. And that actually changes the behavior of the model. So the model kind of imagines the, its own correct behavior in those different circumstances. So here uh, we can see that how Lingo model reasons about the bicycle. Which said I should maintain a safe distance from the cyclist um, because cyclist is a potential hazard. And if we ask what else I'm paying attention to, it would say that it pays attention to both uh, park uh, to park cars on both sides of the road uh, because uh, pedestrians might get out of you know behind the cars. Uh, so we can generate different weather conditions with Gaia, uh, including night driving, sunlight, twilight, gray sky, etc. Uh, here's a nice example where we condition an action by overtaking a bus. So specifically, we, we kind of decide uh, the the initial clip is just to show the bus effectively, right? But then we say, okay, what would uh, happen if you would decide to accelerate? And we don't tell it to actually overtake. We just say that you have to accelerate. Uh, and uh, in that case, model correctly uh, generates the sequence where it actually overtakes the bus. Um, last two, uh, how fast are you driving? Uh, I'm driving in uh, 20 miles per hour. You can see it on the road. Um, yes, it can reason about traffic signs. And uh, what exactly would happen if you break the speed limit, right? So you would endanger myself and so on. Uh, yeah, and that's it. All right. So I don't, I don't quite hear, uh, you know. So, uh, yeah, now you can hear me better, I hope. Uh, yeah, so we have time for questions. Um, if anyone in online has questions, you can raise your hand and I'll try to take that into account. Um, anyone here has questions? <laughs> Yeah. How are you using uh, the Gaia model internally? Like, how, how are you leveraging the generation of these scenarios? Is that for data augmentation or is it for validation scenarios? Or how, how do you leverage that to be able to develop your applications? Uh, yes, I. I, I Could you? Bar yeah, barely. But uh, yeah, I think I, I got the got the question. Uh, yeah, so currently, uh, the, the whole idea of Gaia, there are so for all those models, there are several uh, different use cases that we are uh, kind of planning to use it for. And uh, uh, the guy is kind of uh, most likely, so what one, uh, so just kind of the, without going too much into uh, proprietary stuff, right? But uh, so a few use cases, uh, obviously data generation, right? So that's that what you kind of hinted to, right? Since we can, uh, pretty much modify any scenario to with text to uh, any other scenario. For example, we can go and add snow, right? Or add rain to our already, ex uh, uh, already existing data sample. We can augment data and train our driving models for that, right? Uh, you know, there are a few other uh, examples uh, specifically so the, the whole the whole, uh, the whole idea of uh, world models originally came from actually controlling Atari games some some time ago, 
And uh, in that case, uh, you can use world models to predict the uh, uh, future and plan accordingly to predict diverse features and choose the right one, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so, however, uh, right now it's still kind of work in progress. So we, you know, we, <laughs> I, I don't want to say at this point, like how we are going to use it. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So maybe I can ask a question, then you want Usman will ask a question. Um, so I'm curious about how you train these models. Um, so I guess we could speak on either one about either one, but uh, maybe Lingo, since that's the last one you spoke about. Yeah. You, give, yeah. you you listed a lot of training uh, data sets there, right? Could you could you give one example at least of one of the data sets, and you can explain how that connects to the model that you presented? Mm -hmm. Right. Or, yeah. Um, what type of um, loss you use to train it? Mm -hmm. If you show your slides again. And... Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, so the loss at the end of the day for all those transformers is just a prediction loss, percentage loss of the next token. So yeah. that is quite standard. Uh, so there seems to be a mismatch between the task that you're trying to solve and the data sets that you normally have access to. Yeah. So uh, for for Lingo, the the the, the main the main uh, I guess uh, the main challenge is that we want uh, diverse questions and answers for uh, small snippets of videos, right? So the training data consists of small snippets of videos. Uh, paired with uh, several questions and several answers and sometimes dialogues. So uh, one of the most straightforward way to get it is literally just ask uh, humans to interact with the model and record uh, questions and uh, you know answers from the model. And if human doesn't like the answer, human can go and change the answer and say, okay, that's the correct one. And we did that for, for, for a little bit just to collect the validation set and so on. But this is not a scalable way to get those pairs. Uh, this is a way to, again, get a validation set uh, and maybe uh, evaluate the model and fine tune it a little bit. So the most scalable way to do that, uh, well, one would be externally label uh, data with annotators. Uh, but uh, while we kind of started those approaches, they kind of keep going. And this is very long. Uh, kind of long horizon approach, right? Where we just need to establish a contract with a company that obviously previous uh, talker uh, and, uh, know quite a lot, right? And so on and so on. Uh, but we found quite a lot of success in auto labeling pipelines. pipelines. So this is how it works roughly. So we take, uh, and this is, you can see here, my slide kind of on the, on the left here. Uh, so we can take a data set where we have uh, some labeled uh, perception data, for example, uh, cuboids of, of uh, all cars and pedestrians. Uh, then we can take several frames uh, and describe in text. Uh, so we, we, can, we can take those cuboids and literally put them in text saying, okay, a car is detected at those coordinates and so on and so on. Then we can query ChatGPT just using open, open AI API and or other language models and uh, tell uh, ChatGPT to describe the scene in a high-level language. With that, we will suddenly get uh, a, a video sample with a high-level uh, high language description. Then we can go uh, one step more and ask ChatGPT again, can you come up with, let's say, five questions to that description and correct answers? So that gives us, uh, for that video snippet, uh, let's say, five pairs of questions and answers. So this is uh, very scalable, uh, maybe a bit expensive, right? If you like, kind of depends, right? It's not, it's not quite expensive, but uh, it is it is quite noisy, right? So in a, in a sense, you you kind of can't squeeze more information than you have in the cuboids. Uh, so you have to be careful with prompt engineering and so on, so on. So this is like a, a big field of uh, how to make language models, you know, do what what you need from them, uh, right? But uh, so that is, uh, was really a fruitful approach, right? And uh, another approach is to mix uh, that with uh, kind of really crude human labeling where uh, you kind of just put very high level descriptions which are not in your cuboids or, or nowhere else. And then again, you ask GPT to incorporate that information. So, so it's like really actually sophisticated pipelines 
that um, at the end of the day produce a uh, video snippet and several question answer pairs, right? So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the main approach. Excellent answer and uh, super interesting. Uh, so, you want, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, and uh, thanks, Oleg, for a super interesting presentation. Uh, so I'm curious about Gaia. Uh, when it comes to these uh, videos that you generate, uh, I guess you can use them for um, you know, planning ahead as well and what kind of actions you should perform, right? Uh, can you comment a bit on, uh, you know, how do you um, relate different future scenarios to each other for, for the planning? Uh, how do you assess the risk between them? Uh, can you condition it to generate like, certain risk scenarios, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, so on that, uh, this is this is a work in progress. Uh, first of all, so uh, as of as of today, what we presented publicly was uh, actually video generation only, uh, without yet uh, putting it into any planning systems. So what I can uh, say though are, uh, you know, I can <laughs> roughly describe how like uh, Alpha Go, Alpha Alpha Star, and so on, right, work, and uh, not Alpha Star, I guess, right. Uh, mu zero alpha go and so on, right? What they do, is, and you can, uh, you know, uh, figure out how to do the rest, I guess, right? Is that what they do? They you generate several videos, uh, you generate several several futures, and you uh, generate also quality uh, for every future somehow. Specifically for uh, alpha go, it would be: Are you going to win or lose a game, right? Or what's your value function for the end of those? evaluation and then uh there is a policy network uh that can select uh appropriate future and then the next task would be okay well given the future given the future you want to have what would be the uh action that you're supposed to generate having that future and this is how uh again alpha go uh would work so yeah except uh yeah in self-driving it's a little bit different and uh yeah, I'm sorry, I just cannot like go too far into that. But but so. but do you have like a feeling for uh, how light? So are all the futures equally likely, or do, no, do no, you... no, no? Yeah, they're not. Uh, so so this is uh, very. It's kind of emerging property here. Uh, so you can see here that there are many futures you can think of, right? For example, I can can think of a future where I go inside the building on the left, right? That's like a a possibility uh and uh you know it's in principle in, in principle it's physically doable thing right to just go and like uh, uh crash into the wall uh but you can see that the model here unconditioned uh, generates two actually likely futures that are that come from uh expert driving data so the, by the way so this day so the data for the for the guy is coming from uh you know human drivers that do something reasonable right we, it's not coming from uh, let's say accidents or anything crazy like that, right? That's why in this specific case on the roundabout, it predicts that, okay, well, the human can do two reasonable things here. Uh, well, maybe it can also make a U-turn, right? But in this specific case, we just say it's straight and right. And, uh, you know, so, so, so first of all, no, not all features are likely. So it's only good features are likely according to that model, which is actually a kind of really interesting emergent property, right? You actually... Uh, it just doesn't generate you bad bad futures in the first place, right? It generates you good options that you can yes. choose from. But but all those options that it generates, it's hard to distinguish the likelihood between them, I guess. Uh, yeah, it kind of depends on. The, so in this specific case, probably likelihood is the same. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, how you know? Probably in this specific cases, it would be maybe exactly the same likelihood, right? But then since you do have a route map in your head, right, you can. Not only you had, well, in, in your data, you know that, for example, your car is supposed to go straight, then you can clearly evaluate, okay, well, this is the good future on, on the left, let's say, and that's the one you're supposed to take. But uh, yeah, I guess my point is that, uh, you know, uh, it's it's very important and interesting that it does not generate bad ones. That's why your pruning is actually an easy task. It's not, it's not you know, extremely hard task where you have to prune it on hundreds of futures. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, it's already two, so let's uh, thank Oleg again. Thanks a lot. Thank